I want to talk around this thought this afternoon. There is a plot twist. Can I get somebody to say, there's a plot twist. You may have lost hope, but there's a plot twist. You may be discouraged, but there's a plot twist. Some of us, you are the plot twist for your bloodline. The plot twist. Somebody say, there is a plot twist. So this, this, this King Encounter series, has it been blessing anybody? Anybody? Don't have to lie. I'm like, kind, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Well, it's been blessing me, and I want to get to work. The reason I really feel as though the Holy Spirit has summoned for us to start off this new calendar year, this 2022 calendar year, dealing with King Encounters, is because I don't want to come before you and preach perspective. We have enough churches that do that. I don't want to come up to you and preach my opinion. We definitely have too many churches that do that. Ever since the pandemic, everybody got a prophet word. Everybody on, on Facebook, I got a word. I got a word. I don't want to be up here <laughs> prophesying to you. I want to give you Bible. Bible so that you could see each and every week, biblical episode after biblical episode, that whenever somebody met Jesus... Whenever somebody had a king encounter, they could not remain the same. It started off first with this woman who was crooked. She was coming to church crooked. Then she had a king encounter and left church straight. <laughs> and I see myself in this woman because I can't speak for anybody else in this sacred space and watching online besides myself, but I can't straighten up my life in my own strength. Has there anybody under the sound of my voice, have you discovered that willpower doesn't work? <laughs> I ain't gonna do it again. That didn't work, you did it again. I ain't gonna respond to that text. You did, you did it again. Willpower doesn't work, I need his power. I need his power. I can't straighten up my mind in my own strength. I need a king encounter. I can't straighten up my own desires because sometimes the flesh be on one. I know y'all look holy, so I'm going to just talk about me. Sometimes my flesh be on one. For the rest of y'all, just pray for me. Just pray for pastor. But the flesh be on one. I need a king encounter. And for some of us, you're like, you know what? The way my petty is set up. <laughs> Is anybody honest enough to say I have it like a petty side? Like it's a judge-free zone here. You know, we believe this firmly. Don't throw a stone. That will be thrown at you. If you're behind the scenes, everybody knew. Yeah, I struggle with being petty. Somebody's like, listen, the way my petty is set up, it just takes the wrong day for somebody to come at me the wrong type of way, and they're going to discover that these hands... They're rated A. Anybody can get it. <laughs> Somebody say, I need a king encounter. Which is why I stated, I don't believe the biblical church should be boring. I don't see it in my Bible. I don't believe church should be boring. When we come to the house of prayer, when we come to the house of God, expectation should be high. Worship should be high. Some of us need some popcorn during praise and worship because you spectate, but you're supposed to come here to participate. We're not trying to give you a concert. We're trying to say, you know what, all week long, I've been in my, my work, I've been at school, but now I'm around my brothers, and now I'm around my sisters. If you don't like praise and worship, why are you going to like heaven? <laughs> like this is not an opportunity to spectate, but it's a time for me. To participate Amen. in the goodness of God. Worship should be high. Praise should be high. You should be getting biblically educated and spiritually edified. Amen. Enough with motivational speeches. Enough with giving us sugar-coated content. And then when I preach a sermon that tastes like salt, you feel like it's judgment. Enough with sugar-coated messages. When we come to the house of God, something should happen. Because Jesus told us. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will also be in the midst of them. Now listen, y'all. I wasn't the best at math. Okay, I wasn't the best at mathematics. Still, to this day, I'm trying to understand what was the point of calculus. 
Y'all can judge me if you want to. But what was the point of Algebra 1 and Algebra 2? It is 2022, and I still have never used A squared plus B squared. Y'all talk to me, equals C squared. I still never used it. And taking statistics in college was the devil. Like frequency distribution. They had to find that formula on the land of the Gadarenes where that dude had a legion of demons. <laughs> Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. I was not the best at math. But as I look around this sacred space, I can see that there are more than two or three people in here. As everybody's watching online, as you look down the chat, you can see that there's more than two or three people here. That is irrefutable evidence that the king is here. Why wow, come out like this? That means the king is here, which means the atmosphere is ripe for a miracle. The stage is set for a miracle. Faith, the conditions are favorable for a miracle. For many of us, the biggest miracle you're going to see today is the miracle of a changed heart. When you don't want to do what you used to. Baby girl and my dude, that's a miracle. When your girls hit you up this weekend saying they're going to go to the club and you used to be the main one that will come on the dance floor and take off your heels and pull up your skirt and you say, you know what? I'm not going to do that because I have made a decision. This year is me and Jesus. And you don't want to do it? Somebody say that's a miracle. When in about two weeks... You won't end up feeling lonely or sorry for yourself or questioning the timing of God because it's Valentine's Day. And all of these people are posting pictures about how they got relationship goals, but they were really arguing before they posted. You won't end up questioning the timing of God because they posted about their chocolate and they posted about their flowers. I'm just convinced somebody under the sound of my voice, you're like, I'm going to get my own chocolate. I'm going to get my own flowers. I'm going to get my own lobster. I am not about to allow a man-made holiday cause me to question my value in Christ. Somebody say miracle. The miracle of when you desire to actually seek God's face. The miracle when you don't want to get high anymore. All that does is it's escape to try to escape your reality. But once the high fades... Ooh, we got real. I'm talking to somebody. Once the high fades, once you're no longer tipsy, once you're no longer lit, once you're no longer faded, you still have to deal with you. Ooh, ooh. Y'all ain't sweating, but I'm sweating for you. Ooh. Can I talk to somebody real quick? For those of us who are engaged in substances to try to escape our reality. For those of us who are using sex to try to escape our reality. For those of us who are runners. When it gets hard, you run. When it's difficult, you run. When you're getting corrected, you run. For all of the, I, I would like to talk to you for a second. Um, you could move. You could change your career. You could change your house. You could change your spouse. You could change your bae. You could change your boo. You could change your eye color. You could change your eyelashes. You could change your hips. You could change your lips. You could change your breasts. You could change your backside. You could change your hairstyle, but you still got to deal with you. So listen, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> you can't outrun you, this is why, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is why I believe some people ghost people. Yeah. Yeah. Are we in the house? Yeah. Those who have ghosted, ghosties and ghosters, we all present. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is one reason why people go ghost and we end up, like our heart ends up dealing with the collateral damage of it. I used to think it was something I did until I got the revelation, they're running from themselves. And they just paused to be with you for a second. But when they looked over their shoulder and saw the real them was catching up, they kept running. The miracle 
of straightening up. We saw that in week one of this series. We saw Nicodemus who was treating Jesus like a side piece in John chapter 3. Y'all preach it with me. Somebody said it with me. Treating Jesus like a side piece in John chapter 3 to where he's openly in broad daylight at the cross in John chapter 19. And I asked us the important question, which one reflects you? The Nicodemus in John chapter 3, nobody knows you're a Christian? Are the Nicodemus in John chapter 19, I'm going public with this. I'm unashamed of this. What happened between John 3 and John 19? What happened between those 16 passages? Nicodemus had a key encounter. Then last week, we talked about this man who had a legion of demons. And Jesus had to rebuke a storm to get to the other side just to get to him because the enemy doesn't want you to have your king encounter because when your life changes, your community changes. It takes one life to impact another life and impact another life, so I have to try to stop it. Jesus had to go to the other side to activate his evangelist. Now, this particular Sunday, I want to show us a biblical episode that some of us have possibly forgotten. It has gotten lost in the fabric of the many miracles that Jesus did throughout his earthly ministry. And I want to show it to you. It's this nameless widow who is at the funeral of her son. Luke chapter 7. That was a lot, wasn't it? Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. The gospel of Luke chapter 7, verse 11. If you do not have a tangible Bible, we'll have it projected for you on the screen. Luke chapter 7, verse 11, it says, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. So this is a funeral procession. When the Lord saw her. There it is again, y'all. When the Lord saw her. Remember week one, the woman who was crooked in the synagogue. But Jesus saw her. Once again, when the Lord saw her. This is for everybody who thinks God forgot about you. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the beer, or in certain translations, it's the coffin or the casket that the boy was in, and the barriers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. I felt that while I was studying. That's what God is saying. I know the breakup hurt. Get up. I know you didn't expect this season. Get up. I know you're going through something traumatic. Get up. You might need a minute, but don't let the referee of life get to 10. You might need to catch your breath when you hear one, two, three. But by the time the ref of life gets to four, you you should start moving. By the time it gets to five, you should start trying to stand up. Don't lay on the canvas of defeat. Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began talking. (laughs) Once again, if I was a disciple, I would have been high key, not low key, I would have been high key freaked out. You go to a funeral and have a dude pop up in the cast was talking about, hello. All right. (laughs) Somebody said, I'm running. I'm with you, girl. (laughs) I'm not featured in The Walking Dead. I'm good. Then he went up and touched the coffin they were carrying, and the beer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout the Judea and surrounding country. Our verses 
of emphasis, of verses that really reveal the power of this particular king encounter. The verse that is going to serve us as a waiter throughout this sermonic journey on this afternoon is Luke chapter 7. Verse 13, it really doesn't make sense to me. And it was bothering me as I was studying and prepare, preparing for this message. It's when Jesus goes up to this widow and says these two crazy words. Don't cry. Jesus, don't cry. I'm like, um, Lord, she's a widow. Like, she hasn't even fully been able to catch her breath from the asperity of dealing with the loss of her husband, which has now economically and socially placed her in a financially tumultuous situation because most widows in that day struggled with poverty, which is why the Bible tells us, look after the orphan and look after the widow. I haven't even been able to fully catch my breath yet of losing my husband. And now I have to wake up on today and experience the eulogy of my son. I'm not even prepared yet. I'm not even there of getting over what currently happened. It's like I can't catch a break. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice? Well, it feels like as soon as you try to recover, something else happens. You're trying to get your feet firm. You haven't even fully recovered from the last storm. It's still low-key drizzling, y'all. Something else happens. The wave of disappointment hits again. The wave of loss hits again. The wave of being tested hits again because adversity comes in waves. And somebody, if you were to be honest, you would say, well, if adversity comes in waves, then tonight I'm drowning. Hit after hit, trial after trial, battle after battle, storm after storm. They're leaving where they just had her son eulogized. And look at this, y'all. Jesus' first words to this woman. I told you I used to be a student pastor for nine years, so I try to make the Bible come alive. I'm thinking, Jesus, the proper thing for you to say when you meet this nameless widow who is grieving and crying over her son is, we send you our condolences. That would have been appropriate. We, we send you our condolences. Or, or, or what about saying, I'm so sorry for your loss. I can't imagine what you're going through. Like empathy and, and sympathy, you would think that would be, or, or better yet, why not, Jesus, tell her, follow us. Peter, come here, come here. We still have fish and bread left. Follow us, follow me, walk with me, and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. That sounds like something Jesus would say, doesn't it? But Jesus, his first words, y'all, to this woman is, don't cry. That's a, she lost the two most important men in her life. Y'all, put, put yourself in her shoes. Let's just say she was madly in love with her husband. And now she lost her son. The only part of my husband I still had left was him. And you telling me, don't cry? Don't you see my situation? Let's personalize this this afternoon. Don't you see, Jesus, how they did me and you're telling me not to cry? Don't you see how lonely I am? Don't you see that my marriage is dying? Don't you see the report that my doctor just gave me? Don't you see this pandemic? Don't you see my bank account? Don't you see the warfares I'm in? Don't you see the battles? And I didn't even choose this battle. Church family, what do you do when the battle chooses you? Like you're not even looking for a fight. But the fight is looking for a fight. <laughs> You're not even looking for a fight. But the fight is looking for a fight. And it decides to fight with you. I didn't, 
I'm not trying to go to war with anybody. There is this particular battle, y'all. It doesn't matter your age, your ethnicity, your gender, your classism, or your belief. There is a battle that we will all, everybody, under the sound of my voice, who's going to watch the replay and watching online. There is a battle that we all will be drafted in, and that is the battle of disappointment. Talk Holy Spirit. The battle of disappointment. Surely this widow was disappointed. She had to be. Surely she was arrested by disappointment. Possibly even discouraged because this was not her first death that she had to go through. Disappointment. 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 What do you do when disappointment chooses you? Disappointment. Like the disappointment when you're measuring yourself but you keep coming up short. Disappointment. 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 Oh, what about this one? The disappointment when you expected them to pour into you the same way you poured into them. See, now listen, this reveals a level of fatigue that is not being addressed. It's low on the radar, and I want to bring your awareness to it this afternoon. There is a type of fatigue we need to be aware of, and that is helper's fatigue. Helper's fatigue. That is when you are internally and externally exhausted because you have been treating something or someone like a priority, but they treat you like an option. Exhausted. So I will always be there to help you, but it's not reciprocated. It's not reciprocated. Now you're saying, I'm burned out. And I tried to get us to understand on Thursday with Therapy Thursday, a lot of people think being burned out means you have too many responsibilities. I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do that. Sometimes the feeling of being burned out is a revelation that you're trying to give from a place of nothing. I have nothing left to give to my singleness. I have nothing left to give to my children. I have nothing left to give to my church. I have nothing left to give to prayer. I have nothing left to give to my marriage. I have nothing left to give to my career. And so I feel burned out because you're trying to give from a place that's bankrupt. Burned out. Disappointment. Disappointment. The disappointment when you apply, but you get denied. Disappointment. The disappointment of a painful Severing relationship that you thought was going to last longer than it did. And you keep the pain on replay in your head. Keep it on replay. Literally a mental loop of the pain. How could they do me like that? 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 Me like that? And then you walk around and say, man, that happened two months ago. That happened two years ago, but I still feel the pain with the same magnitude when it happened. How could they do me like that? How could they do me like that? Did you know when you keep pain, when you don't have an opportunity to talk about it, to express it, to have a therapy session or a counseling session, because I told us the mouth is the ventilation system of the heart. And when you're not talking about it, your heart is literally not breathing. Did you know when, when you keep it on mental replay, the same chemicals that were released in your body when it happened are also being released when you're meditating on it? Yeah, yeah. It's called cortisol. You know what cortisol is? It is a stress hormone. I want you to view it like your, like your body's inward alarm. When something terrifies you or threatens you. The body releases cortisol. And once the event passes or fades, the cortisol levels go back down. But when you keep on replaying it, how could they do me like that? How could they do me like that? How could they do me like that? This is why some of us have to get off social media because those share my memories remind you they did me like that. They did me like that. They did me like that. Certain wedding invitations, y'all don't want to talk to me. They did me like that. They did me like that. It literally 
requires and causes your body to keep on producing cortisol in an overdose amount. And so now your body is literally trying to figure out how do we turn off the alarm? Because on the inside of my body, it's just, yeah, 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 yeah. That's annoying, isn't it? Y'all probably want me to stop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so the body's like, how can we stop this? And how can we stop the alarm? And so this is why you have insomnia. This is how we develop heart disease. This is why we have headaches. This is why you're not hungry. This is why you overeat. This is why you're gaining weight. This is why you're losing weight. Because literally the body is trying to figure out, how do I turn this off? So when God says, forgive, I'm trying to help somebody. It's because when you forgive, you regulate your cortisol levels in your inside body so it can stop releasing the chemicals that makes the pain feel the same way it did when it first happened. When you keep replaying it, you are literally giving CPR to the pain. Resuscitating it over and over. So when Jesus says forgive, it's because he's so smart that he knows that's going to regulate your cortisol levels. This is so good, y'all. So now, the reason I'm calling this a battle of disappointment is because when you get disappointed, disappointed information, you're trying to find something good. Is anybody there like you try to find the good even though it's bad? I'm trying to find the good in this. Like, okay, it's not God get me out of this. It's like, okay, God, what, what am I supposed to get out of this? I'm trying to find the blessing somewhere in this problem, but due to the gun smoke from the cannon of discouragement, you really can't even find something to, to recognize what was all that for. And so now you're fighting disappointment. You know what it sounds like when you fight disappointment? It sounds something like this. I know I should be grateful, but... <laughs> Your neck, that's what, it, that's what it hit right there, your neck. I know I should be grateful, but I really wanted that position. I know I should be grateful, but I really wanted that apartment. I really wanted that town home. I really wanted that house. Like, I recognize God. I, I see now, God, that wasn't your will. I see that wasn't your will, but can a sister please get married and have children when it's not considered for me to be high risk to be pregnant, God? Like, when you gonna get more kingdom men in stock? Is that too real? Disappointment, 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 disappointment. I'm trying to battle with it, I'm trying to fight it. Or oh, what about the disappointment? This is like one personally for me. Have you ever tried to defend somebody that you were claiming was different and they end up doing you wrong with a remix? Like, I defended you. I was telling people you changed. I was telling them, give them a chance. And they did me the same way with a remix. Hmm. So now, what I tried to get us to understand, like, you're always going to be disappointed when you're expecting loyalty from somebody who only lives for opportunities. I posted a whole video about it. Whole video about it. They're not loyal to you. They're loyal to opportunities. They're an opportunist. You will always be out of tune with the orchestra of the loyal when the only tune you live for is opportunities. So we're not friends. We're not even enemies. We're just strangers who share memories. That's it. That hit anybody? Can I get somebody saying the throat? <laughs> this, this disappointing. You're trying to fight back. Disappointed in the church. We deal with this a lot. I was on this leadership summit with other pastors. And I'm like, okay, a lot of times if we didn't have elders who left millennial pastors a pathway, a lot of millennial pastors have a lot of janitorial work to do. Because due to what we saw from grandma and mama, I don't believe in none of that Jesus stuff. I'm done. I don't do all that churchy stuff. All that, well, that missed me with that. Seriously. So we have to try, because the millennial, not, not knocking any other generation, but millennials and Generation Z, you have to give me logic, not just hype. Yeah. 
Make the scriptures make sense. Who wrote it? Why they wrote it? Who were they talking to? Is that still relevant today? Why should I? Like, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to believe it just because grandma said, you should believe in Jesus, baby. I need some evidence. Disappointed in the church. It was supposed to be a place that gave me healing and guidance, but it gave me trauma and paranoia. <laughs> Preach, Holy Ghost. This is why, ooh, ooh, y'all listen. This is why hell loves the weapon of trauma. Listen, trauma robs your ability to dream. You used to dream about that ministry. Dream about that book that you're going to write. Dream about what your marriage is going to be like. But watch this. Trauma robs your ability to dream, and now you exchange your dream with paranoia. Some dreams you have, God gave you. That dream, and you're like, you know what? I want to have like a nonprofit, and I want to help young men who don't have fathers in the home. I want to have like a camp where there's a whole bunch of older men, and they come together with young teenage boys and teach them how to change tires and teach them how to change oil and teach them what manhood looks like and teach them how to control their anger. That's going to cost millions of dollars to cut down all these trees to get AC and to get it certified by the state and get it approved. That's going to cost a lot. So when God tells you to do something that requires faith, because risk is taking a faith. Risk is, faith is taking a risk. He's telling you to do something that is going to require faith because it's going to collide you with your dream, but your trauma robbed you of your ability to dream so that when God tells you to do something, your paranoia won't let you obey. <laughs> Woo! Did y'all hear what I just said? This is why I feel the Holy Spirit telling me, do a therapy Thursday. Because I have things in the earth that I need for them to give birth to. But trauma has robbed their ability to dream. I gave them that dream. And it was going to be for my glory. But they're so paranoid of failing. They're so paranoid of looking stupid. They're so paranoid that I'm going to let them drown. That they're not obeying me. So help my people heal. Help my people heal. There's a difference between great preaching and a great pastor. Great preaching wants to give you a good word. Pastors want to help you heal. Pastors want to guide you. Pastors want to help you become. Want to help you become so that you can reach your full potential. Y'all have to excuse me. I just believe this. Church health is better than church growth. If we can have them both, praise God. But where I stand, church health is better than church growth. Making disciples to me is better than gaining followers. Having a pure heart is better than pushing a church brand. Having a heart of humility is better than notoriety. I don't need for anybody to know my name. God knows my name. Listen, I've discovered this. Humility helps you deal with humidity. When life gets hot, the Holy Spirit helps me stay cool. I want a healthy church, and I want to be able to trust God, but I keep on feeling disappointed. And then we got these churchy colloquialisms to try to encourage us when we're disappointed. And we'll start saying stuff like, well, you know, delay doesn't mean denied. <laughs> y'all heard that before? <laughs> I'm going to mess y'all up. Because I was messed up when I was studying this. Yeah. I understand you ain't get it, but delay doesn't mean denied. And I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me while I was studying. Anybody who seeks my face, who strives to live in my will, there's no such thing as delay. Ooh, I'm about to mess up your theology. It's quotable. Delay doesn't mean denied. Anybody who's seeking my face because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I'm ordering your steps. So even when you make unwise decisions, because somebody like, you know, because I messed up. Yeah, you did. I did too. You created an Ishmael, but your Isaac is still coming. Look, look, you feel as though, yeah, I, I kind of was agreeing with you, but there's some stuff I wanted that got delayed, bro. I'm going to just be real. Did it really get delayed or did you give it a deadline? Talk to me. Look, look, are you disappointed because it's really delayed or because you had an expectancy on when you wanted it? Let me give you a Bible to mess y'all up, okay? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, 
it says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Oh, we're going to get this. Left side, say appointed. appointed. That was weak. Left side, say appointed. appointed. Right side, say time. time. Say appointed. Left side, y'all kind of weak. I know y'all got masks on, but try, okay? <laughs> One more time. Left side. Appointed. There you go. See, y'all had it in your whole time. Right side. Time. Okay, so there is an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Is there anybody else who read that and are like, that doesn't make any type of sense. Though it tarry, wait on it. For it does not tarry. Okay, God, is it tearing or is it not tearing? And then I had the revelation. I'm the God over time. You are in time. I know the appointed time. It's not the uh, appointed time. So you're waiting for the appointed time. You can't expedite the appointed time. Just know that I have an appointed time and it's going to happen. <clears throat> Look, it's like you're starting a ministry and you want a building. You want it June of 2022, but the appointed time is April of 2024. So the reason they keep denying you, the reason you're not getting approved, you're thinking it's your credit, you're thinking it's, they're being racist, you think they're being prejudiced, but God's like, no, it's an appointed time. The reason you're so disappointed is because you want it in June of 2022. My appointed time is in April of 2024. You're even more disappointed in August of 2022, and then more disappointed in October of 2022, and you start saying stuff like, delayed doesn't mean denied. And God's like, it's not delayed, it's just coming April of 2024. It, one more example so y'all can really get it. it it's, it's like you have a doctor's appointment at 3. And your doctor is booked, but you figure, you know what, I'm going to show up at 9. I'm going to just see if they can take me. Anybody did? I just want to see if they can take me. When you go up to the kiosk and they tell you, no, we can't take you, they're not being mean to you. That's not to discourage you. That's not to get you disappointed. It's just you have an appointed. God, I hope y'all can get this. One more. I was talking to my barber about it. I said, hey, bro, when I come into your barber shop, the left door is locked, but the right door isn't. If I stand at the left door and I'm getting all frustrated and I'm getting all upset because it's not opening, I would look stupid. Right? Right? Because God gave me this word. Disappointment is never for discouragement. It's always for direction. God is going to help somebody. Help me. It's never for discouragement. It's for direction. The reason this door isn't opening, it's not designed to discourage me. It's to direct me that the other door is. Am I helping anybody this afternoon? Listen, y'all, the reason we have to talk about this is because whenever disappointment and discouragement get married and they become intimate, they will have a child called depression. Did you hear what I just said? Whenever disappointment and discouragement get intimate, they have a child called depression. And I'm trying to encourage somebody. The disappointment is not to discourage you is to direct you. You're so discouraged because you don't recognize this means I got something else. You're so discouraged and disappointed because you don't trust my appointed time. I'm going to give y'all more Bible. This blessed me during study time. Y'all have to see this Ruth. Y'all only know about my homegirl Ruth because of Boaz. But you do know Ruth was married to somebody named Malon before Boaz came. But we don't even remember Malon because what God did in her life was so big, we forgot about her past. <laughs> Please get this, y'all. Look, look, Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. It says, so Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. I said, Ruth, you preaching, girl? Seriously, I looked at this while I was studying. I said, oh, she preaching. Ooh. She said, 
when I go to a field, if they don't accept me, I'm not disappointed. I'm not discouraged. That's just showing me that's not my field. If I go into this other field and they say, get out of here, I'm not discouraged. I'm not disappointed because it just showed me that's not my field. She was so wise that she was able to recognize wherever the favor is, wherever the favor is, that's where I'm supposed to be. So when she was stepping in Boaz's field and he came in the room, sounded like somebody from New Orleans talking about who that. When he came and said that, she recognized I must be in the field that God called me to be in. And I'm trying to help somebody who's battling with disappointment. Be like Ruth. Find your favor factor. They don't accept you. It's not what your favor is. Not what your favor is. But watch this. Malon had to die so she would be directed to Boaz Field. Who in here is trying to resuscitate their Malon? See how quiet it got? I'm putting my foot on the gas. Come on, Holy Spirit. Who is trying to resuscitate something that has died for the purpose of something that's going to make you alive? Trying to resuscitate what you thought God was going to use. And you're missing what God is going to use. Disappointment. So now it makes sense why Jesus tells us in Luke 7 verse 13, don't cry. Because he knows verse 16. So good, y'all. I got all that from one verse. <laughs> Holy Spirit gave all of that from don't cry. Now look, Luke 7, verse 16, it says, they were all filled with awe and praised God. Hold up, hold up. Don't cry, verse 13. They all praised God, verse 16. What happened in 14 and 15? A king encounter. And not just that, y'all. This blessed me so much. Jesus gave her a king encounter with a plot twist. <laughs> you thought that this was going to be your pain place. Plot twist. This going to be your praise place. Amen. Look, y'all, so good. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. It's so good. You came here today because you thought you were going to just get a eulogy. Plot twist. You're going to leave here with a testimony. You were crying your tear ducts out last night because you have to bury your son. Plot twist. You're going to go home today holding your son. Who in here am I preaching to that Jesus is saying, if you look again, there's a plot twist. I know it didn't go the way you want it to go. Plot twist. I know you don't like it. Plot twist. I'm trying to show you I have better. And there's somebody in here and somebody watching online. You're about to give up on something that the king is about to hit your life with a plot twist. Plot twist. Can I get everybody to say this? Everybody watching online, can I get y'all to put this in the room? My title, by the way, is There's a Plot Twist. Can I get y'all to put this in the room? And everybody say this as loud as you can. Father, Father I, thank I thank you for I thought it was over, it was over. but you had, you had a plot twist. Plot. One more time. Father, I thought it was over, but you had a plot twist. Plot twist, plot twist. Don't cry because there is a plot twist. When I first started this journey of following Jesus, it hit me when I was in college. Like I thought I was saved. Anybody ever thought they were saved? And you're like, oh, I was tripping. <laughs> like I thought I was saved. But once I really began to navigate this Christian journey, I began to ask God this question. Why do you allow certain things to happen that hurts? Anybody ever ask God that? I told you you got to think. You can't just tell him, trust God, baby. You got to tell him, like, think. <laughs> why, why do you allow stuff that hurts? And, and, and the verse that was bothering me was Luke chapter 22, verse 31. This was Jesus talking to Peter. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Lord, have mercy. But uh, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. Okay. The, the puzzling part about that to me is not where the text says strengthen your brother. I get that. 
Iron sharpens iron. All day, I get that. I pull out your roar, my dude, you pull out my roar. I got your back, you got my back. I'm talking about biblical friends. You know, those who help me help you mature. Anybody have any of those? Oh, Lord, we don't. Okay. I need, unless y'all didn't raise your hand, but I'm talking about people who help you mature. Like friends that if something happens good in your life, they act like they won too. Like you got good news, they're like, okay, where are we going tonight? What are we doing tonight? We turning up, huh? In a godly way. But we turning up though, right? <laughs> what are we doing? They feel like they won. Those type of friends. Those type of friends you got to be careful with because if you don't like somebody, they'll start looking at the other person like, you don't want no problem, no problem. Hold on. Okay. That's not Christ-like. That's your problem. Handle that. I'm pray for y'all. That don't bother me. I'm not even bothered when, when Jesus says, Satan has asked for you. That didn't bother me because one of the evidences that your birth was a problem, like one of the indicators that you waking up each and every morning causes for fear to strike the camp of hell, that's revealed by continual enemy contact. Like some people, you don't even understand what I'm talking about because you're behaving your way into seasons. Ooh. Like you're behaving your way into seasons. When it's, some, like when it's our choices, we can always trace it back to something we did. But when it's in a spiritual or satanic attack, we don't know what's going on. Family acting crazy, people on the job lying on me, house broken into, breaking into the car. What in the world is going on? It's because when you live a life that gets on hell's nerves, hell tries to get on yours. <laughs> that, that, that part doesn't really bother me because I'm a worshiper. The problem when Satan attacks a worshiper is we know where to go and we know how to fight. I fight on my knees. I know how to fight. He hates a through-it-all worshiper. That doesn't bother me. The part that bothers me is what Jesus says. He's like, hey, Simon, Satan has asked for you and he want to sift you as wheat. But I pray for you, bro. <laughs> Hold on. Anybody else read that? If I'm Peter, I'm like, Messiah, <laughs> Excellency, um, I don't know what to call you. Don't just pray for me. I need your prayers. I do. But stop it. Anybody else like that? <laughs> stop him. You see him asking for me? Stop him. Don't just tell. Stop him. Block him. Reroute it. Come on my side. Knuck and buck on him. Do something. Okay, don't just pray for me. So he asked to sift you. Then I begin to study. The word sift in the Hebrew is nuah. It means to shake, to beat, to toss back and forth. So really Jesus is saying, hey, Simon, Satan has asked to do something in your life that's going to leave you shaken. Something that's going to shake you up. But as I start studying a little more, I recognize the only reason you sift wheat is so that you can get off the residue of the chaff. Preach Holy Ghost. The only way you can get off all the stuff that's not supposed to be there is you have to beat it. You have to shake it. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to plot twist the devil. I'm going to make him stronger from this. I'm going to plot twist the devil. All the stuff I wanted off of him, go ahead and sift him. It's going to get off anyway. So it causes me to trust even when I'm going through stuff I don't like. God knows what's best for me. See, guys, look. He literally is the author and finisher of your faith. Okay? You got to view. I want you all to view this book as your life. There's a book of your life. All right? So God knows your chapter one to your last breath. He knows all of it, y'all. Not just some of it. There's nothing you could do. That's like, oh, I forgot that part. He knows all of it. This is why sometimes when God tells you to do something, it doesn't make sense. You know why? Because he's telling you from chapter 42 what to do. But you over here in chapter 16. And then if you like me, there are things you want to play out in chapter 17. So you have your plans and then God has the audacity to wreck them. Has God ever wrecked y'all plans? Like, like you have plans. Look at all. I have plans. What I'm going to do. Okay. Well, that was disappointing. That didn't work out. 
well, I'm going to dust off and I'm going to try again. I'm going to do this again. You know that God told you something that don't make sense to you. Because he's speaking to you, remember, from chapter 42, but you're just in chapter 16. And so you try to do something in chapter 17, and then once again, God wrecks your plans. Now, what Satan wants you to do is not trust God because of this. To doubt his existence because of this. To say that prayer stuff doesn't work because of this. Because of the stuff that you try to narrate. The edits you tried to do. And so, all that church stuff don't work. But what I'm trying to get you to see, the reason God wrecked it is because he knows what's needed for chapter 17. So that you can get to chapter 42. When he gives you a word that doesn't match your season, it's because I'm speaking to you where you're going. I'm not speaking to you where you are. Some of us, you live your life just reflecting on your history, but God still has all these chap- chapters of your life for your destiny. Doesn't make sense when he tells you when you have wells that you didn't dig and vineyards you didn't plant. Remember the Lord your God. When you're in the wilderness, he's telling you your chapter 42 while you're in chapter 16. So I want to help somebody today. Whenever you get a disappointing word, Could it be possibly God has a chapter 42 for me that I haven't met yet because it's an appointed time? Jesus walks up on this lady, interrupts the funeral, just interrupts it. God ever interrupt your life? Interrupts the funeral. And the Bible also says that he walks up to the casket. Like Jesus is bold, y'all. I'm really thinking about this. They're pallbearers. Okay, bodies are heavy. I don't know if y'all ever been one, but I'm sure they didn't have wheels like how we have. They're carrying this cask, and Jesus just comes, puts his hand on it. I said, God, why did you touch it? You could have just walked over and just said, get up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> He's God. I mean, right before he gets there, the Sanhedrin was telling him, like, yo, don't come under my house. Don't come to my roof. I'm not worthy. Uh, Just get a word, and I know my son will be healed. So Jesus could just say it. Why did you touch it? And if you read your Bible, once he touched it, everybody stopped. God literally said, pause. (laughs) This is so good, y'all. Pause. I'm not done. There was another time in the Bible where God paused something. It's when Joshua was in battle, and he needed the the sun to stay up a little longer. And for his child, God said, pause. I'm trying to get us to thank God for all the times in your life he said, pause. See, some of us, you feel it in your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, about to respond to that text, pause. About to go over there. Pause. They didn't have no blinker on before they cut you off. Pause. Does anybody have that pause? Something that pauses you. And I'm thankful that God saw my life in rebellion on my way to be eternally separated from him. But he said, pause. I have a plan for their life. This is not the end. He paused the whole funeral procession. And hit everybody with a plot twist. Because that's what the king encounter does. It stops you from going where you were headed to. And introduces you to the one that gave you life. Three points I'm going to get out your way. Point number one. Stop performing CPR on Malon. Stop performing CPR on Malon. The thing that is no longer conducive to your destiny. Don't you dare sabotage your future peace because chaos is familiar. What is it that you keep on trying to resuscitate? That God is saying, I need for this to die. Because I'm pointing you to Boaz Field. If Ruth wouldn't have met Boaz, she wouldn't have had Obad. Obad wouldn't have had Jesse. Jesse wouldn't have had David. Seeing this. Some things in your life I need to die. 
Stop performing CPR on May Lime. Point number two, disappointment is a compass, not a verdict. It's a compass, just showing you another route. That's it. Whatever you're crying about, whatever you want it to work, just showing you another route. Now, it will be ministerial injustice of me to not say, if you live in a life of rebellion, you're delaying a lot. Period. Just like obedience opens doors, disobedience causes delays. So when I'm not trying, I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. Nobody here is perfect. Y'all know the quote. I'm not going to sin less. There you go. Talk to me. I'm not going to be sinless, but I am going to sin less. When I'm striving to be in God's will, when I'm striving to be in God's will, the stuff that doesn't work is always for your good. It's a compass, not a verdict. And last one, very basic, but it blessed me. The appointed time can't be rushed. It can't. I think baby boomers have it a little better than us. I couldn't imagine writing a paper messing up and having to start all over again. That whiteout didn't work all the time. Typewriters, I can't imagine a typewriter. Like when I want to say stuff, I just pick my phone up and say it. Like you want that package to get here early, pay it $4.99 for expedited shipping. You real, real hungry, go to the drive-thru. You don't want to cook. That's our methods, not God's. Whatever he has that's your appointed time, you can't expedite it, but you can trust him because the gap from the appointed time to where you are exists to prepare you for what is appointed for you. Did you hear what I just said? It's to prepare you. You're not ready yet. You're trying to give birth in month two, and you still have to wait till, till month nine to give birth to what I put on the inside of you. Trust the appointed time. Trust the appointed time. Can I get us to raise our hands? I'm going to pray. Father, forgive us for not trusting you. Forgive us for trying to be God of our own lives. Forgive us for blaming you for all the things that we're disappointed of and all the things that we wanted to work out in a certain way that it didn't work out, just maybe you truly are God. Just maybe you are the author and finisher of our faith and you know what's best for us because you're a wonderful father. Help us to trust even if we're in chapter 16 and you give us a word that doesn't make sense. You watch over your word to perform it, and your word does not return unto you void. We lift our hands as a sign of surrendering our will, of surrendering our way, of surrendering our appetite, of surrendering our desire. God, we need you. And forgive us for trying to live lives as though we don't. When we are prayerless, it reveals our arrogance is saying, God, I don't need you. God, I got this. And we sit before you with our hand raised saying, we repent. We don't have anything without Jesus. So God, would you give us the faith? Would you ignite in us the fire to trust you even when you hit our life with a plot twist? We ask for you to do it in Jesus' name we pray.